right, welcome back, everybody. Let me check to see. Looks like Erica is in. Thank you for posting that. So I know that folks are are um, coming in. Yeah, looks like, oh, wow, we've got 92 online, and that number is growing. Well, welcome back, everybody. I hope you enjoyed the first session today earlier with Sarah. I think that was wonderful. Super excited for the event. I saw everybody in the uh, reception area <laughs> was at Kara North's table. That was kind of funny um, that, that everybody was in Kara's. But uh, nice. again, during the breaks, if you're interested in talking to some other instructional designers or getting more tips or just generally networking, those tables are a great place to do it. There's a couple of them. Um, hosted by TPLD. Kara's going to be there. I'm going to set one up for um, Connie, um, our next speaker. So um, take a look for that there. And with that, let me start with Connie's intro. Um, I Connie has been kind of, I've been in this space for like almost 20 years and Connie has been here just as long, probably much longer and longer. has always been like a, a really, 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 really solid resource. Like, um, um, Kara was saying in the last session, I think Kara posted that um, Connie's a goat. So um, Connie helps people learn and build instructional design skills at Mastering Instructional Design. I'll post the link to, um, to this community. It's masteringid.com. She's a consultant, author, and international speaker in the fields of learning experience design and visual design. Um, Connie's also the author of Visual Design Solutions and Visual Language for Designers. Both of those books... Um, are available on Amazon. I'll go ahead and post the links to those as well. She also publishes the e-learning coach web website and podcast. Those are amazing. I, um, if there is a site that you should bookmark right now, if you haven't already, it should be, um, the elearningcoach.com. Definitely, uh, um, subscribe to that one bookmark it. Um, Connie shares incredible, incredible information on there on a regular basis. She was honored with the Guildmaster Award in 2018 for contributions to the learning technologies industry. If, uh, for those of you that don't know what the Guildmaster Award is, it is something that um, that the Guild, what is it called now? It's called the Learning Guild. Um, yeah. um, uh, awards people uh, at their larger events at Learning Solutions and at DevLearn. And Connie is one of the few that actually have a Guildmaster Award. So uh, oh, thanks. we have a, a celebrity in our midst here. And with that, Connie, I'm going to go ahead. I'll share the links to all these things that I have for you. And with that, I'll take it. I'll let you take it away for what's possible creating your future in instructional design. Thanks so much, Lois. And the problem with that intro is now I have to do a good job and that could be a problem. So uh, hi, everyone. You know what? I learned so much from you. I learned from people who don't know much about instructional design. They ask the absolute best questions. I learned from experienced people because they have different experiences than I do. So I just never stop learning from you too. I am serious about that. Uh, guess what? You won't believe this, but I have some slides. I, I do. Well, uh, Welcome to What's Possible, Unlocking Your Future in Instructional Design. It looked like there were a lot of experienced people there. So I hope we have a few newbies who are trying to break into the field because that's what all this is about. What I've been doing for years is helping people learn, build, and grow instructional design skills. I have a free 12-lesson career course, just about the career, called uh, Breaking, that's at Breaking into ID. I have the e-learning coach site. You won't believe this, but it was started in 2009. Yes, there's over 350 articles. I'm just, for those of you who are like me, just super passionate about learning, instruction design, I just can't get enough of it. So that's that site. And three years ago, I started a community called Mastering ID, where I teach people to, and we all learn together, to how to build uh, their instructional design skills. So that's my background. I'm really into visual design too. Um, so if you're confused about instructional design, I totally get it. I, I mean, it's, it's just so normal because just think about this. I read about a meta-analysis that looked at 25 years of research 
on instructional design expertise. And here is what the researcher said. Here's what she found. Instructional design expertise was often broadly framed within a discussion of ID as a complex, often ill-defined problem-solving task. So if this researcher was confused or essentially read all of these articles that did not define instructional design well or instructional design expertise well, then how can you be expected to understand it? So I totally get it. And on top of that, These are titles that people have found that explain or that represent an instructional design job. Well, who wouldn't be confused there? And by the way, I will be giving these slides in a PDF form to Lewis, and he'll be posting them after the event. So I put a, a link in down here so you too can have access to this Google document with all of these titles for instructional design jobs. Pretty crazy, huh? And years ago, Ellen, oops, I think I just lost something there. Years ago, Ellen Wagner wrote about or talked about the e-learning pie. And I felt like this was a really good way to wrap your head around e-learning slash instructional design. Of course, the two were not synonymous. And then in her book, The Accidental Instructional Designer, Cami Bean also took off on this and wrote about it. So one part of the pie is learning and educators, uh, people who are really into cognitive psychology, really enjoy this part, this aspect of instructional design and creating and designing e-learning and other learning experiences. Then there's the creativity part. That might be if you're designing, uh, people make games, they design graphics and create graphics, they tell stories, they shoot videos or write video scripts, they do a lot of writing. So I think a lot of people also want to enter the field because they feel a lot of creative energy and they love to make things. Another part of the pie is the technology part. Now, if you're doing instructor-led training and designing for instructor-led training, you don't have a technology part. But if you're doing e-learning, video, audio, augmented reality, virtual reality, wikis, content curation, all of those things, there's this technology aspect. That would include working with authoring tools, getting into data analytics, perhaps doing LMS work, learning management system work. There's programming, there's accessibility, there's user experience design. All of these may tend to be in the technical part. And then there's the business aspect of instructional design and e-learning and a lot of people who enter the field may not be that interested in this, but there may be some who are, some of you who are. And that might involve figuring out what a business needs, being able to consult, to liaison between different groups, being able to handle clients and account management, being able to schedule and run projects that are on time and on budget. Thinking about the return on investment and people in the field call it ROI, you know, that's actually a slightly controversial topic in instructional design because some people say that often the return on investment can't be measured. It may change a culture or it may change people's motivation and that's difficult to measure. 
and sales is another aspect of the business part. If you divide the entire e-learning pie into these four groups, it may help you wrap your head around the field. So I hope that's helpful. In fact, if you do find it helpful, why don't you say so in chat? I can't see the chat, but Lewis will tell me what you're saying. So I've spent a lot of time working with people who want to transition into the field or who want to upskill. And I've come to conclude that there are three keys to unlocking all of the diverse opportunities that are in instructional design. I have a feeling if you're new, that there's much, much, much more to it than simply making e-learning or using Storyline like the job postings will have you think. It's so important to have the right mindset if you want to build your skills. It's really important to find the right path for you. You don't have to follow the most well-known path and that can help unlock new opportunities for you. And finally, because you are a unique individual, you may be able to find a talent stack, and of course I'll be explaining that later, that's right for you. And I'd love to do, if we have some time, a little bit of a talent stack exercise with you today. If we have some time, I think we will. So let's talk about the right mindset. Can you do me a favor and in chat, what's your biggest mindset obstacle toward reaching your goal? Your goal might be entering the field. It may be improving your skills. It may be going independent. It may be getting a promotion. Lois, are we getting any answers? Where is he? Anybody want to read? Hey, me? Hey, hey, I'm sorry about that. It's okay. Yeah, we are. Sorry. There was some good stuff and I'm actually posting some stuff to the QA for at the I'm end. Sorry. Yeah, no, no problem. No, no problem. Um, <laughs> let's see. I'm just right at the bottom here. Uh, Kelly saying never thought of going independent. Karen is mm -hmm. saying entering the field. Oops, it's flying by. Um, let's see. Erica saying being stuck in teaching and not finding a job in ID. Mm. Um, Don is saying keeping up with the younger talent. <laughs> mm. Amy adds ageism. Um, mm. Flora saying how to get foot in the front door. Yeah, the lots of stuff. Okay, wow, my heart just is going out to all of you. Really, I can feel it. Um, I can feel what you're feeling. So let, let's just talk about a few of those things. In terms of ageism, I think we just have to, you know, because I'm um, on the older side of things too, we just have to overcome it with our energy, with our confidence. Um, there, there is so much, I hate to say it, wisdom or knowledge that you get from having so many unique experiences. So to whatever extent you can, and I don't, I don't mean to be glib about it, I know it is a real obstacle in society, try to you know, come across and make it a value. You know, think of it as something really valuable. For the people who are having trouble getting their foot in the door, I am. I, I feel for you and I'm really hoping that uh, to this event is going to really give you a lot of new ideas for being able to break into ID. I know it's not always easy, but I see lots of people doing it with persistence, and confidence. And that's one of the things I wanted to talk about now is one of the key things that I see holding people back, and it happens with me too, I am not immune to this, is just the ability to build your confidence. We just have to all keep working on it. I lack confidence many times. I think I'm not right for a particular thing that I'm doing. We all have to build our confidence. And here are some ways to do it. If you're trying to enter the field, put in the time and effort 
don't try to take shortcuts because if you take shortcuts, you'll know you took shortcuts and that will decrease your confidence. So really put in the time and effort to build your knowledge and skills. I'm not saying you do not have to be an expert to enter the field, but you have to know the process, know how people learn. You've seen the e-learning pie, pick out a few areas there. And one thing that I found is you have to schedule learning time. When people put it on their to-do list, it's very easy to not get to it each day. So instead, put it on your calendar, give yourself some blocks of time in the evening instead of watching Netflix, early in the morning or on the weekends. And I know, I, again, I'm not trying to be glib. I know people have parents to take care of. They have kids to take care of. They have big deadlines at work. I understand that. If you can, sacrifice something else and put it on your calendar. That's what I've seen work for people. Here's a big one. We all give ourselves negative self-talk. We say things to ourselves that we would never say to anyone else. You just have to, I heard someone say, turn off the mean girl. Just ignore any negative self-talk or mean boy. It's going to just keep babbling away in your head. And if you ignore it, it may get a little quieter. Don't act on it. And finally, you know, learning is social. COVID really put a damper on things for going to conferences and going to chapter meetings. But if you have a chance and if you're willing to go out now, like most people are, I can't tell you how nice it is to get in person, to socialize, to network. Some things that come to mind are the learning guilds, events, AECT, if you're into the education world, ATD has chapters and they and the chapters in, in all of the big cities in the U.S. or most of them. And the chapters are uneven. Some are going to be great and active. Some are not. But just getting in there and going to a few ATD chapter meetings is just a wonderful way to get a feeling for what's going on in the field beginning to meet and talk to people, hearing the vocabulary, and, and seeing how people speak about it. So I think that can be really helpful and make you feel more confident. Anything about that? Anything, anybody talking about, you know, actually while I'm here, what have you done to build confidence? Anything that, we, that I haven't mentioned here? I only mentioned four things. There must be many, many others. You can answer in chat and Lewis will tell me. I'm not going to let him do anything else. He's going to have to keep watching that chat. Yeah, I'm just sitting here, eyes glued. Let's see. Um, Lauren Decker is saying, I've been going through LinkedIn learning and taking as many courses as possible. Good for uh, you, Lauren. Cheers. Yes. Good for you. Karen says, lots of reading and research. Oh, uh oh, it's flying through now. Um, <laughs> uh, let's see. Jennifer saying, she earned her graduate certificate in instructional design. Ooh, um, good for you. Yeah, Yol Yolanda's been doing podcasts. Ellie is doing reading, reading, and re more reading. Um, America's been getting, um, doing thing. Oh, wait, getting feedback. And let's see, who is this? Don connected to this community. Yeah, lots of different ones. Okay, that's wonderful. Good for you. Okay, I'm really happy. And those are all ways to build your confidence. Once you start hearing the terminology, you've got the buzzwords down. We don't talk about students. We say tar target audience, right? It's all the same thing, basically. So you get the buzzwords. You start to feel comfortable. I think it will help you build your confidence. Now let's talk about the right path for you. Oh, my gosh. There are so many opportunities for people who want to break in the field that you may not have thought about. So and there are a lot of different ways to slice and dice it, too. For example, what type of organization do you want to work for? A lot of people call it corporate training, but it's much more than corporate. You could work for a government organization or department. You could work for a nonprofit. Maybe your favorite charity or your favorite nonprofit would like your help. You can work in higher education. 
School systems hire instructional designers to be curriculum designers. In fact, where I got my master's degree, it was in the curriculum and instruction department. When you work for a business, very often, most often, the mission, okay, I think there's kind of two kinds of businesses. One, that's very mission oriented. So that's one thing. But another type of business is very finance and money oriented. And that may be great for you, or it may be a turnoff. So you really have to stop and think about it. In government, often there are there's a lot of bureaucracy. Maybe not always, maybe not a city government. But those are the kinds of things you have to think about. What about a nonprofit? I've done work with nonprofits. They're a little bit, I can't say they all are, but I noticed them to be a little bit more disorganized than businesses. Well, being disorganized, I love that. So <laughs> it works for me because then I get to do kind of like what I want. So who knows what kind of, you know, thing you'll, that will turn you on. What about higher ed? With, in higher ed, you get to work with faculty members. Maybe you love that idea. And people have all kinds of great academic discussions. Maybe that's what you want. Or maybe your heart is really in K through 12. You love K through 12. See if you can find some work with a school system in your area. Just write that alone. Just shows you there are so many opportunities. But each one is going to be different. What about the type of work? When you are working with internal clients, internal projects, that means you're working for a very large organization, let's say Amazon. And Amazon has many training departments. They have to train their own people. That's going to be completely different, or it could be, than working with external clients. External clients, let's say you're working for a pharmaceutical company and you're a freelancer. Well, they can really give you some tight deadlines that you may not have control over. Or maybe you're working for a large training company that only does external work. It's going to be very diverse, and that part is really fun. But sometimes the, the deadlines are really bad, and, the, and you, or the budgets are bad, and you can't do anything about it. So each one has its pros and cons. Or what about commercial products? Some companies only put out training materials to sell, and that's a whole other world. And then you can try to focus on one type of audience. Adults, teens, children, special needs, second language, the list goes on and on. If any of these things light you up, try those out. Try focusing and finding work in one of those types of organizations. Anything in chat there, Lois? I'm just curious if people are responding at all. Lots of stuff going on in chat. <laughs> yeah, it's going. Yeah, but um, yeah, actually, a lot of the conversation is is going around like um, more resources and and mm, um, okay and, and that type of all thing. Right. So yeah, you're good. The back channel, got it. <laughs> That's all a big part of it. The back channel is important. Okay, I'm not sure how that happened, but anyway, let's go on. The size of your team. This is kind of a big deal. When you work with a large team, I kind of love doing that. I've done that in the past, ran a big, large team. We had our own 3D animator. Of course, that was in the old days. Uh, all kinds of people to brainstorm with. All kinds of people to run ideas off of. On the other hand, and all kinds of capabilities. On the other hand, there was more conflict because there were more people. What about a small tight team. That might be what you like. And often when you're working alone or in smaller organizations and sometimes large ones, you can be a one person team where you do everything from analysis all the way through, if we're talking about e-learning, all the way through development, and you would, might do marketing for a course. So maybe you would love doing it all. Personally, I do. So the size of team can really influence the type of work you do every single day. So think about that. There are lots of opportunities in all different team sizes. 
what would you like? Now, if you happen to be a subject matter expert or you have worked in the field and you just keep getting work in one area, you may want to focus on just one type of content. I ended up working in medical and I kind of fell in love with it because it was so deep. It was something to sink my teeth into. I didn't know much about it. And the way you can work in a field where you don't know much about is because instructional designers are content neutral. And we have ways through our content analysis, instructional analysis, action mapping. There are lots of processes that you can use to figure out what the content means. And you get to work with subject matter experts who can help you through the rough parts. I have an article called on the e-learning coach called, uh, I think it's called instructional design is content neutral, if that interests you, because we often have to educate people to tell them we can work in any field. Now, okay, I, if someone asked me to teach nuclear physics, I would probably say no, unless I really had a SME on board who could help me every step of the way. But most of the content that I've been able to work with in 25 years, it's all been ultimately understandable. So that means it will be for you too. But there may be, you know, something special that really interests you. Maybe you just love soft skills. That's an opportunity to, to uh, focus on that. Make your resume and your portfolio focused on that. And your talent stack too. Okay, here we go. You can also... Think about, well, what type of format and media do I want to work with? Now, I'm not saying it's super easy to, to get your choice, but let's say virtual reality fascinates you. You've taken some certificate courses in it, and you've actually created a sample VR course. Well, maybe you can find companies that are solely working in that area and find a job. On the other hand, some people just really don't feel like working with technology very much, and they prefer instructor-led training. Well, in instructor-led training, instructional designers can make the curriculum. They can make the participant and, and um, instructor manuals. They can make the slides. They can come up with engaging, wonderful activities. Now, I would say that most places will do several different types of things, but it's possible to just pick out one format or media, whatever you call it, and find work there. And don't forget, instructional design is not just about e-learning. If you're new to the field and you look at the job postings, you could almost think the two are the same, but they're not. Anytime we're building structured or formal learning experiences. Instructional design is needed and sometimes even for some for informal experiences. All right, let's talk about some of the specialties because I think this might get missed on a lot of people. Some people fall in love with storyline, Captivate, Camtasia, they love the technology. They love the tools. And if that's the case, you may want to learn HTML just so you have a little bit more technical knowledge and CSS. Get really good at one of the authoring tools and a few of the minor side tools and become a developer. You don't do any analysis. What you do is you're handed storyboards by instructional designers. And that is how many organizations, not most, but a certain number of organizations divvy up their work. There's the instructional design work and there's the development work. So if you really love creating e-learning and want to do that alone or other technical aspects of learning experiences, focus on just being a developer. 
I don't think there are a lot of jobs yet, but this is definitely up and coming to be a community manager. So there are, it might be more likely in an association or a very large organization where there are people who are enough people who are so interested in a particular topic that they have a community of practice. It's also good for people who are experts. Lots of experts don't need course after course after course. They just need to keep up with things the latest. Let's say you may work for a scientific association. A community of practice there would be perfect for scientists or medical people. What about data anal? <clears throat> Try to say that quickly. Data analytics. You love numbers. You love statistics. You took an extra statistics course in college. More and more organizations need someone who can understand data and make recommendations, find insights, find ways to manipulate the data so that you can figure out ways to improve workplace learning, improve developing people, help people find correct career paths, all through data. And that's also being used in higher education. They look for which students are most likely to fail out. Which students are most likely to succeed? What are the signs? What are they doing right? So data analytics is up and coming. It's already here. And I think most large organizations will be interested in hiring someone who is a specialist in that area. Some people call it learning analytics. Okay, this one is, I've had people say to me, an LMS administrator is not an instruction designer. And technically that's true, but it's a way a lot of people can break into the field. It's also great for technical people. You end up managing the, uh, the LMS. Oh, and if you're not from, uh, I think everyone here is familiar, but just in case, a learning management system launches courses and tracks what the work that people have done in the courses. Um, LMS administrators I've seen have really gotten into creating standards. They liaison between the organization and the LMS publisher because everyone hates their LMS or most people do. And they always have to tweak things and fix things. Um, they will also train staff on how to use the LMS. So, and sometimes I've seen people break into the field from that because they, they learn Storyline or Captivate or whatever authoring tool the organization uses and things need to get tweaked a little because they're not working correctly. So they kind of get in there and work on it and they begin to learn how to design and develop. They see what's wrong. Or some people just want to focus on being an LMS administrator. So that's another path. Another one is a project manager. Now, of course, I doubt if an organization, I could be wrong, so you can let me know in chat. I doubt if an organization is going to hire a newbie to be a project manager, but it can be a focus and a goal. This is for very organized people, people who can do estimates, people who can run budgets, people who love making projects run smoothly. And you know if you're one of those people, you run your house like that. You're always on time, you're always in budget, you know how to resolve issues, project management might be for you. That's why I didn't go into it. Media specialist. Ah, the people who create the graphics, the videos, the audio. I would say a large um, instructional design group may have their own graphic person. They may expect everyone to do it, but maybe not. So you may find a media specialist position. Maybe it's possible even in a small team. So that is another specialty path for you to think about. And there are many, many more. There's knowledge management. There's content curation. There are a lot of ways to break into instructional design. Any questions, Lewis? Well, to be honest with you, we have lots of questions. <laughs> No, you better not be hard ones. That's all I can say. <laughs> well, um, but we'll save them for the end. But there's a, 
probably close to a dozen in there that. Um, oh wow! You sure? We'll I, we can do it now. If you, a few now, if you want. Um, uh, it's up to you. If you. All right, we'll you, skip it again. Okay. Okay. But I will say this, everybody. If, if you go into the Q and A area, you can see that there's a little arrow beneath, um, like in each question you can use that to vote for like the, the questions that you want answered ones that you feel oh, are more okay. of a priority. So if anybody wants to, if you want to start voting for those and so we can, at, we can answer the more popular ones when we get to the QA um, period, um, that'd be helpful. Okay. And then I'll, and I'll hang out at that table that I'm never giving you time to set up for me. <laughs> sure. 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 Thing. And okay. answer any other questions there or just chat just for fun. Now let's talk about talent stacks because this is what I think might be a real key to getting your foot in the door. All right. So what's a talent stack? A talent stack, the whole idea of it was um, developed by the cartoonist for Dilbert, Scott Adams. And he said he was kind of an average illustrator, oh, kind of funny, an okay writer. I forget what his fourth thing was. Maybe it was just, oh, okay, at marketing and business. Just kind of average or good at all of those things. But he formed a town stack by working on those skills. And together, there was a certain amount of synergy. And now he has an extremely successful cartoon called Dilbert. Okay. So a talent stack are your complementary skills that work well together and create a unique synergy. So it's something to, you know, you really have to stop and think about it. The other approach, of course, is to become expert in one area. And that's okay too. But if that's not your thing, if you gotta do you and complementary skills are going to work, then maybe this is something you should think about. So let me give you three examples. Here's a writing talent stack. Let's say you are skilled at writing for lots of different styles and formats. In the world of e-learning, instruction design, you've got uh, manuals, you've got uh, video scripts, audio scripts, uh, text for e-learning, instructions, micro copy, which are short little blurbs, little phrases, little instructions. And you turns out you found out you're a really good editor. You can go through people's work, quickly find the problems, point them out to correct them, and people come back to you and go, wow, thanks. Or maybe you did that in college for friends, and people said, this is great, thank you, I got an A. Then you're a good editor. Of course, you're going to need your instructional design skills. And maybe you have something else, like you're good at marketing. You know how to promote courses, engage audience, and motivate. All right, let's say you've never been in the field before, but you have um, a child that's in the Girl Scouts. And every time the Girl Scouts put on an event, you've marketed it and done a great job. Or let's say you work with a nonprofit, a volunteer organization, and every time they're looking for volunteers, you've been able to market that need and done well at it, then you're good at marketing. Sure, this doesn't mean that you're never going to uh, continue to learn. No, this is it's exactly the opposite. You've got these skills, you're decent at them, you're going to really work hard at improving them. And on your resume and in your portfolio, you're going to stress your amazing talent at writing. That's what I mean by a talent stack. Let's look at another one. What about if you don't want to do e-learning? You want to be a trainer and a facilitator. You love that. You've been in the classroom. You don't want to sit behind a desk all day. Well, if you're doing virtual training, you are going to be sitting behind a desk. But you only be, be behind a desk part of the time if you can go out and be an in-person trainer. Because you'll probably be creating the materials. You're skilled at instructor-led training, group facilitation, and verbal communication. And I was thinking, what happens if you've been a teacher? Well, yeah, we can call that instructor-led training or instructor-led, classroom-led 
skilled at somebody come up with something in chat. You know what I mean? Okay. Another way group facilitation. Let's say every time there was a teacher's meeting, you ended up running the group. There you go. You're a group facilitator and you find that you're very good. And I would say most trainers and facilitators are at verbal communication. You can explain things well. You don't get irritated. You're patient. You can help people find common agreement. There you go. You're good at verbal communication. You've shown leadership. You can lead group meetings. When there are issues, you can find ways to resolve them and come up with good solutions. Yep, you need to know your instruction design if you're going for an instruction design job. Hey, what about this? I know educators often use PowerPoint. It turns out that you're really good at it. You've learned it. Your slides look great. Okay, this could be your talent stack. I'm going to do one more kind of quickly. What about if you've been focusing on accessibility? This interests you. You have a personal stake in it. You would like to be an accessibility talent stack. Let me tell you, there's a real need for this. Many, many organizations do not have someone with these skills. And yet, because of legal obligations, ethical obligations, they need to convert their e-learning and make it accessible or their websites or their documents. You're knowledgeable of the latest accessibility standards. You know how to implement them in Storyline and in PDF documents. I'm not saying you know how to implement them in every website and in, in everything, but you've learned how to do it in Storyline. There are courses on that. I've taken a course in it. And I've seen ways that you can make your PDF documents accessible too. So. If you can implement that, you probably know more than many, many instructional designers in the marketplace. Got to know your ID. And you've got interpersonal skills because perhaps you have done research or you need to speak with and test out people who have different disabilities. You've tested your e-learning on them. You've tested your documents on them. And you can talk about, uh, you can be the liaison between people who have a disability and a technology team because you can explain it. You can go to them and say, listen, your website isn't working with their JAWS reader. Can we get this straightened out? Here's the problem. So that's an example of an accessibility talent stack. Do we have time to work on a talent stack? I don't know how much time we have. We need to do some questions and answers, but let's just take a few minutes, okay? Just grab something to write with, or you can just answer in chat. Let's look at this e-learning pie. Do you think that you can find a talent stack in one of these slices of the pie? Do you love learning cognitive psychology? Do you love trying to figure out how people think, how they act, how they retain knowledge, how they build skills, how they transfer skills to the workplace? If you love that, then maybe the learning area is for your talent stack. And by the way, if you haven't yet read Julie Dirksen's book, Design for How People Learn, you should. It's a great intro to cognitive psychology, and it's really fun and funny. That was quite a feat to be able to do that. Are you just dying to create things? Do you feel in the zone when you're creating e-learning or graphics? Do you love to write or tell stories? Do you think you'd be great at coming up with scenarios? And make that, make creativity your talent stack. How about tech? Oh my gosh, you cannot stop learning HTML, CSS, authoring tools, Camtasia. You just can't get enough. 
You love no code tools. You love making websites, whatever it is. If you love technology, focus on that. If you find yourself being really interested in business, you feel like you can help a business succeed, even if it's an association. Associations never have enough money. Well, okay, that's not true. But you feel like you can help a nonprofit by making, by creating better learning experiences. You love sales. You would love to work with the sales team. You like finance, finance. You like figuring out return on investment. Then let that be your talent stack. So to shorten the exercise, because I want to do some conversation here, just in chat, can you please write down if one of these or two of these slices are exciting for you. If you think you can focus on them and create a talent stack for those. Okay, we're seeing learning and tech. Oops, there it goes. Learning and creativity, learning and creativity, <laughs> learning, learning and tech, technology <laughs> and business, creativity, Ooh. tech, business. Yeah. Learning and creativity, creativity and technology, learning and business. Yeah, lots of... Uh, Lots of interesting combinations there. Business seems to be the one I'm not seeing as much of, but... Um, you know what? I am zero surprised. <laughs> <laughs> I work with so many new instructional designers or people who want to transition, and many of them are not interested in business. And, you know, it's okay, but you have to have, if you want to work in the workplace training, you have to have, and even in higher ed, I guess, you know, the, oh, everyone has a budget. And everyone has deadlines and you have to at least keep that much in mind. It was a real adjustment for me. I mean, I'm totally fine with it now, but it was a real leap for me to understand. Oh, this has to do with money. How much time I spend on it. Oh, okay. I can't just play all day. Yeah. Kind of, anyway, I'm wishing you success. Um, I can't wait to stop sharing and, and talk to people. There you go. Okay. So Connie, first of all, out of all these series, this is our third series we've done this, the third conference we've done this. This has got to be one of the best ones for sure. You are helping so many people with that. So so thank you so much for, for, um, for that wonderful presentation. And yes, if you can make those slides available, I'm happy to share them with everybody. I'm going to email them to Lewis. I'm sorry, Lewis, I kept you on your toes. Um, <laughs> I'll email them to you and you will post them. I'm happy to have you have them. Sure. All right. So we've got a bunch of questions. Let's see if we can get through. Uh, we'll try to get through as many as we can. Okay. Uh, I do want to mention, I'll set up that table for you. Just give me like, you know, probably takes me like two minutes to do it. So after, after the session is over, everybody, if we don't get your question answered, and I know there were a lot of questions that came through in chat that I wasn't able to catch. Um, make sure you go. Uh, you know what? I can, I can start looking at these questions now. No, well, let me give you. Oh, good, good. Well, let me. Um, I'm, I'm going to go through with the highest voted ones. We'll start Ooh, with this first that's one. That's fancy. Yeah, from Emily. Um, would love info on how to train myself for ID. I know there are a ton of free resources, but need direction. Kind of hmm. general, but um, what do you think? Sure. Well, uh, I would start with. Mm, okay, so there's two areas that I think are equally important: how people learn the cognitive psychology. So I often tell people to start with Julie Dirksen's book, um, Design for How People Learn. That's good. And then learn an instruction design process because once you learn one process, you can adjust and learn a lot of other ones. So I would say it's possible that most people use Addy, uh, the Addy process. Um, I try to update that process and use more of an agile process. There's successive approximation, but I'm going to guess, and maybe people who know, um, who are more in on the interview end of things could can tell everyone, are people still asking a lot of questions about Addy in conversations, you know, in interviews? Maybe you can add that to chat, what you think. But I, I would certainly be able to talk about the Addy process, A-D-D-I-E. And then once you've learned that, you can adjust things and, you know, add prototyping and different ways to make it more iterative. Right. So you think books start with books. I mean, cause I know that you could probably get an idea of what being like an instructional designer is on YouTube, but probably not shouldn't be your first 
um, first source for, for information. Well, well, you're absolutely right. Um, there's LinkedIn Learning, which is only $25 a month, and you can cancel. You know, there's, um, Ed, I think EduFlow has a free course. I'm not sure. Yeah, people tell me Udemy has a course. I mean, I think there are some of the lesser expensive courses. And yeah, you, the only problem with YouTube videos that I would say, and I've, I haven't been through all of them, so I could be wrong, is that it's not systematic. You want to go from start to finish, okay? You want to find something that's going to take you through an entire process. And um, I would start in those two areas. All right, what do we got next? These are exciting that you have them voted up. Yeah, yeah. So next one, voted up. What instructional design memberships do you recommend joining, such as ATD, Learning Guild? Um, mm. I don't know what, there's a bunch out there. I mean, been around forever. Training Magazine, Training Industry, I'm sure. True, um, true. I forgot yeah. to mention them. And there's AECT for people who right. are interested in the education world. Um, Boy, uh, I don't want to say which one's the best or my favorite because I know people at all of them and I don't want to get anyone mad at me. So let me just say there are pros and cons to both. ATD definitely has chapters and it's less expensive to join your local chapter than to join the main organization. Sorry, ATD. And um, if you go to it, they have monthly meetings with speakers and some chapters are fantastic and, and active and some aren't. I think, I don't know, but um, I've heard rumors about some, but anyway, so ATD is great if you want to attend chapter meetings. And of course their events are great. They're very, very large. The Learning Guild has great online events and in-person events also, um, and lots and lots of free material. You can join them as a free member. So that's a pro for that and uh, download lots of research reports and other types of reports. And they have free webinars. And I'm pretty sure ATD has free webinars too. Certainly the chapters do because I know I speak at some of them and nobody ever pays me for them. <laughs> Ain't that a shame. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the, 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 and the thing is, is with, with a lot of these too, with ATD and both Learning Guild, if you do sign up for the free memberships, you're probably going to get barraged with tons of emails and stuff too, like because ultimately they also want to market to you. So keep that in mind. Good I point. do think, that, yeah, there are, um, you know, if if, if you just um, you can you can find some of the places with incredible content um, that is free, sort of like this event. Um, I you know we do some other free events as well that are free. So just keep an eye out for those. Um, but so just test it out. I, sh I should have mentioned, obviously, this organization. This group. Yeah, I mean, TLDC, we have a membership, and I do try to, like, make, you know, have great content um, for our members. And eventually, when we start doing live events again, that will be um, a part of the value prop as well. So um, consider that. And plus, we're cheap. We're oh, cheap. you know, I should say also, well, Mastering ID, my community has a monthly yeah. price, and we have monthly speakers there. But also, Training Magazine has... Um, Free webinars. I've spoken to some of them. So that's another good group to be a part of. Training Magazine Network, I think it's called. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. All right. Michelle asks this question. How do you sort through job postings for the type of content, size of team, type of work, et cetera? Oh, why did you ask it? That's a hard question. That's a hard one. All right. So I'm going to say that you can get more of that information by talking to them. Um, sometimes they'll actually say great team player. And then, you know, collaborates well, then, you know, that, I mean, that could mean with a client, but sometimes you can get some hints if you read that whole big, long explanation. Other times, I think you would have to literally ask those questions at, during an interview. You know how they always say, do you have any questions? So I would ask what's the size of the team? How many people am I working with? Are there other instruction designers on it? Um, it, do you mostly produce e-learning, instructor-led? Now, I, I do think that it, it may say e-learning or instructor-led and those kinds of things in the uh, job posting. But I've also heard from people that a lot of times those aren't true. Uh, those aren't accurate, rather. They just throw something out there because it was an HR person writing it and they didn't really know. So as you get along in the interview process, you should double check on that. I know a woman who didn't want to do any development work but did no storyline, took a job that was only for instructional design and she ended up doing storyline work. So 
you never know. Type of content is kind of um, obvious. Like if you go to a bank, you know it's going to be internal financial work, that kind of thing. So if you go to a large organization that only does one type of work, that will be your clue that it's going to be that type of work. If you work at a hospital, it's going to be legal and medical. Right. Like. Okay. Good stuff. Okay. Another one from Michelle. How does someone transitioning into this role practice these roles to see what they like best or are, are most successful in? I don't know of a way to practice. I mean, you have to know yourself well and try it out. Like so many people I know worked, thought they wanted to work in a large organization. So they tried it out for a couple of years. And then it turned out the politics were so much so heavy and i'm not putting down large organizations you might thrive in a large organization but i'm just saying i happen to know a few people who worked in a large org um worked there a few years you know it's good check it out try it out learn all you can you can learn a lot from all the different people and then it ended up that they really wanted to be and work with a small team in a small organization so i think you just have to know yourself well as best you can and try it out you know the I mean, even sticking with a job for a year or two, no matter what it is, you can really learn a lot. Love it. Okay, let's see here. I really like this one. Is there a milestone or achievement mm -hmm. where you can confidently start calling yourself an ID? This one's from Rich. Hey, Rich. I know Rich a little bit. Um, that's a great question, Rich. Um, I think, well, you know, you're going to start call Let's. I think we can call it teachers and educators, instructional designers, if you're designing any curriculum or lessons, okay? You may not think of yourself that way, but if you're designing any kind of learning experience, you're an instructional designer. So, Rich, I'm going to anoint you instructional designer. Um, I do. That doesn't mean you don't have to learn the stuff. You know, yeah, if you want to do it in the workplace, you have to learn a process that's used in the workplace and you have to learn how people learn, make sure you get your cognitive psychology down. But um, yeah, I really think teachers design a lot, a lot more than they think they do. Yeah. All right. Um, this will be the last question for now. And then, um, and I'll have to close the session out, but this one is, I think oh. in reference, this one's in reference to, um, to Ellen and Cammie's um, quadrant. Mm. Uh, let's see here. Do some IDs do all those roles? Where do most IDs spend their day? What qu quadrant? Hmm. That's a tough one. I don't think I know the answer. I mean, I do think IDs often do all of those roles. And that's why it's so crazy. That's why we can't explain to someone. I remember I used to say to my mother, I do computer stuff, you know, and that was enough, right? <laughs> So yes, we often do all of those roles. Um, as a manager of an instructional design team, I had to go on sales calls to tell because the salespeople didn't know what I did very well, you know. So that was the business side. I had to run projects. I was not the greatest at sticking within budget. And then the other stuff, we can do it all, or you can try to focus on, you know, I would say the first two, um, the learning part and the create, well, no learning instructional, you know, the instructional creative part. And oftentimes you have to design storyboards and create e-learning. So that would be three out of four. Good question though. Yeah. Um, you question. know what? One more. Can we just do one more? It's so brilliant. I'm freaking out. Go ahead. All right. This one's from Amy. Um, if I want to look for developer jobs, what sort of title should I be searching for? Are there jobs where the instructional designer and developer are the same job? I would say most uh, and people can correct me who are experienced here. I'd be curious to see what you have to say. But I think most instructional design jobs are both roles. But it will say it in the job posting, must know storyline, must know captivate. That's your clue that it's developer. Oh, you want to do, oh, I see. You want to only do developer jobs. Okay. Um, they they may be, well, I would look for e-learning developer roles. I'm, you ha you're going to get a link to um, that list of search you know, all those titles, and you'll find ones there, courseware developer, e-learning developer, um, storyline, that kind of thing. And then in your interview process, you can talk about uh, whether you want to, you know, whether they want you to do some of the instructional design work. You know, I've found that it's very helpful. On occasion, I haven't been the developer, and I've had to work with one during my um, client, uh, you know, contract work. 
And I find I found it helpful to work with a developer who understands instructional design. So the person can, you know, push back at me and say, really? You want to have that much text on the screen? And I go, oh, yeah, you're right. I don't. Thanks. Let's make that two slides, you know. So it can be helpful to, to just know, have some ID background and then become a developer. Yep. Love it. All right. I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up. Everybody, um, I'll have that table set up in just a little bit. Uh, definitely join Connie there if you can. Connie, thank you so much for making some time. Um, can you tell me how to find the table? What's that? How do we find the table? Oh, when you back out, you just go into the lounge area and the table okay. will be in there. Just give me even 60 seconds. Um, you know, and everybody, it's like, Going to a songwriter conference and like being able to sit with Paul McCartney. You want to be able to, okay, yeah, to that's join Paul. Call. Just call me Paul. <laughs> yeah. So you'll want to want to meet up with Connie in this one. So um, Connie, thanks so much. This is going to be Thank such a, a hugely helpful recording for everyone. And um, hopefully we'll see you again soon. Thanks, yeah, everyone. Thanks for asking me. Bye. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone.